If you just came in, be sure to have Brian scan your badge uh, to get that extra raffle entry for the one tenth ounce gold eagle we're going to give away on Saturday. So. And if you haven't come by the booth yet, come by to get that second scanning. And it is 1040, and since we're streaming, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, good morning and welcome. Uh, this is, uh, my name is Rich Checkin. I'm president and COO of Asset Strategies International. I've uh, been with the firm about 27 years now. It's a 42-year-old firm started by my uncle and his partner, Glenn Kirsch. Um, and we're so happy to be here in New Orleans. Either Michael or myself or both of us have been at every conference since 1974. Um, for me, as a precious metals dealer, I feel like this is hallowed ground, right? Because James U. Blanchard III, it was the start of the hard money movement. You can't do it nowadays, but back then in the 70s, he would fly planes over the White House saying legalize gold. And he's, he's the reason we can own gold these days. And Brian has done a fantastic job carrying on this legacy. So we will always be here. If there's one person in the audience that's enough for me, we're going to show up. Okay, and I'm glad that you guys uh, feel that way as well. I, I mentioned earlier, we took a little poll, uh, so I know how this story is going to finish. Um, but uh, how many people went out last night uh, and got up too late this morning to read the paper? Or just couldn't read the paper this morning? Um, you may not have seen, but way back in, in, the, in, the, in the back of the newspaper, there was this article that talked about um, last night Vladimir Putin, uh, Rishi Sunak, and uh, George W. number 43 all died and went to hell. Did you guys read this? No, they did. They, they, they went to hell. They went down, and the devil's kind of showing them around. He's like, you know, hellfire, pain, suffering, damnation, exactly what you would expect in hell. And Putin notices in the back room there where Brian's standing, there was this big red phone, right? And Putin's like, what is that? The devil was so proud. He's like, listen, it's the newest technology. It allows you to call back to the living world. Putin's like, oh, I've got to try this. He gets on the phone. He calls the Kremlin. He's on for about five minutes, hangs up. Devil says that'll be half a million dollars. Putin has an anger problem. He threw a fit. He said, you've got to be crazy. I was on the phone for five minutes. Devil said, you don't understand. You're dead. You're talking to living people. That technology costs money. Pay up. Putin begrudgingly paid up. Rishi Sunak gets on the phone, calls 10 Downing Street. He's on the phone for 10 minutes, hangs up. Devil says that'll be a million dollars. Uh, he heard the old argument with Putin. The math worked out. He said, fine. He paid up. George W. 43 gets on the phone. No fiscal restraint whatsoever. He's on the phone for like three and a half, four hours. He calls back to D.C. He calls a ranch in Texas. He's calling friends, families, pets, people he doesn't even know. He eventually hangs up the phone. Four hours later, devil says that'll be five dollars. Putin threw another fit. You can only imagine. I mean, he's on the phone for five minutes, half a million dollars, million dollars for Rishi, and George W's three hours, three and a half, four hours, five dollars. And Putin says, you got to be kidding me. And the devil says, listen, you don't understand. Since Biden took over, America's gone to hell. It's a local call. <laughs> da -dum -dum. So I tell that joke, and I've been telling that joke for like 10 years now, and I really don't care who the president is. It didn't matter if the punchline was Trump or Biden or whoever, um, because I group all the politicians together into one pot. They are absolutely terrible stewards of our, of our hard-earned money, um, and they have been fiscally irresponsible for decades on both sides of the aisle, and it's the reason that you guys are in this room today to listen to me talk about gold, okay? Um, so... That being said, I'm going to talk about gold as a winning portfolio strategy. Not everybody shares my belief. You might have heard of Warren Buffett. Uh, apparently, he's made some money in his time. Uh, this is his quote. He said, gold gets dug out of the ground in Africa or someplace. Then we melt it down, dig another hole, bury it again, pay somebody to stand guard over it, and uh, it has no utility. Anybody watching from Mars would be scratching their heads, right? I really don't give a damn what people on Mars do. Um, I don't think they get us and understand us, so I don't really value their opinion. Um, on Earth, gold is pretty damn useful, okay? We found this out in the first quarter, okay? Uh, when the banks were failing, uh, and they were some massive bank failures. I mentioned on the panel yesterday, I don't think we're done. I do think what the Fed is doing right now, I'll get into this, is breaking the bank balance sheets and breaking the backs of the middle class. Um, but. You know, you see the leprechaun here, he shaded it all in for dollars, and he's like, I should have stayed with gold, 
okay? Because that's what was happening in the first quarter. Gold prices surged because everybody was scared to death that the banking system was going to collapse, right? Second quarter, they said, oh, everything's okay. And nobody cared about gold again until about October 7th. Why are we in this mode? Why are politicians doing what they do with our hard-earned money? Um, it's nothing new. Uh, we've seen this all through recorded history. Uh, you go back to Rome, Greece, whatever. Any, any politician gets in power, part of their job is to stay in power. And the way they do that is they make promises. They say, I'm going to do this for you, I'm going to do that for you. They don't say, give me money and I'll, I'll buy your vote. I'll give you money and you'll buy your vote. What they do is they promise to give things to people that, you know, they can or cannot afford. Um, in many cases, they cannot afford it, um, especially when your revenues are anemic. Um, and that's what we've been seeing. We've actually been seeing tax revenues decrease um, per capita uh, over the years, partly because of regulations, people finding alternate ways to do business, what have you. Um, eventually, politicians will find out that more taxes tend to hurt tax revenues, um, that less taxes actually bring more in. Uh, but maybe someday they'll figure that out. In the end, uh, what you have is you have skyrocketing debt, and that could be dealt with one of two ways. Um, you can let the currency default uh, all at once, painfully uh, and, and catastrophically, or you can uh, slowly but surely expand the money to supply. I kind of look at this as little defaults along the way, death by a thousand cuts, uh, and uh, over time the currency gets weaker and weaker and weaker. Okay, That's, by the way, what politicians choose to do. 90% of the time. And, and I'll get back to that point. Um, a lot of talk about Jerome Powell and how he's fighting inflation uh, or price inflation right now with interest rate cuts. And we've been talking about this for two years now. I hope you understand that he can't do this alone. You can't solve the inflationary problems we have with interest rate cuts. Uh, you, you need the help of Congress. Congress has to rein in spending. Um, and unless they do, and right now shows no signs of, of anybody with an appetite to do so, but unless they do, Powell can never fix this. He can never fix this. Um, he certainly can't service the debt at $33.5 trillion. So I usually tell people, if you wanna know where gold is going in the future, pay attention to the money supply. If it expands, right, there's more of those fiat currency notes, whether it be euro, yen, dollars, what have you, out there chasing a finite number of goods and services, okay? And when that happens, you see the price increase. A lot of people look at inflation, they say it's price increases. No, inflation is monetary expansion, which leads to price increases. Anything of value, it will take more of those currency units to buy it in the future. I don't care if it's a gallon of gas, an ounce of gold, a college education, you name it, okay? So if you wanna know where gold's going, look at the money supply. Inflation, as Milton Friedman said, is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. Um, one point I want to make on this slide is, and we, I'll, I'll talk to it when I get to the charts, um, gold is not only useful in an inflationary environment, it's also incredibly useful in a deflationary environment. And I'll show you that on the charts in a second. Over time, when you mismanage your currency and you expand the money supply, that dollar, that purchasing power, that euro, that yen, uh, falls in value steadily over time. And this is, this is the body of work for the dollar, preserving its purchasing power over 100 years plus since 1913 when the Fed was created. As you can imagine, the opposite side of that trade, if you will, is gold and how it's increased in dollar value over that time. Now, does that mean that gold is all of a sudden that much more valuable? No, it's holding its purchasing power as the dollar loses its purchasing power. But you've all heard that scenario, uh, an ounce of gold to buy a nice new suit. In Roman days, a nice new suit was a toga. That's, it cost an ounce of gold. In 1913, when the Fed was created, gold was $18 an ounce. $18 would buy you a nice new suit in 1913. Today, gold just under $2,000. How many guys can buy a nice new suit for two grand? I can, for sure. Can you buy it for $18? Not, not unless you get lucky at a thrift store, okay? So gold protects its purchasing power. Dollars, euro, yen do not, okay? We've seen this over and over. Uh, I went backwards, sorry. All right, so look at the one-year gold chart. 
Everybody uh, was coming up to me last year and say gold didn't do its job. How many people know year on year from January to December 31st what gold did last year? Anybody know? Absolutely nothing. It was flat. I think it was down $3 on the year, completely flat. Um, and I was told in an inflationary environment, why didn't gold do its job? Well, gold started off 2022, moving up. Then the dollar started expanding. It went all the way up to 116, or 116 on the index, and gold went down during that time period. You can see that on this chart, that little dip. And then come September, end of September, going into the third or fourth quarter of last year, dollar went down. It dropped all the way to near 100 on the index, so it lost about 14, 15, 16%. Gold went back up, and in the end, ended flat for the year. Now. Everybody said, but in an inflationary environment, it shouldn't be flat. It should be taken off to the moon, right? Understand the difference, okay? Inflation that we saw over the past year and a half, CPI, CPI PPI, et cetera, this is on the consumer end, retail goods. Okay, what I'm talking about is inflation and deflation of asset values, okay? What happened to asset values last year as the Fed removed the punch from the party? They went down. How much did the Dow lose last year? 10, 12%, I think, something like that. Uh, S&P, 20. NASDAQ, 33%. Um, percent. Uh, Bitcoin, 66%. All these assets deflated massively last year. Gold was flat. And by being flat, it outperformed Bitcoin by 66%, NASDAQ by 33%, et cetera. In a deflationary environment, gold does a great job. So far this year, we saw the first quarter a surge because we had the, um, the banking crisis. Second quarter, everybody took a sigh of relief and just kind of got out of the water. Um, since October 7th, we've seen that crisis speculation and the safe haven flows coming in, and we've seen gold spike again to around $2,000 an ounce. And I mentioned, I don't see it going much higher, sustained. You know, to, to go higher than 2,000 and keep rising higher, I don't see that happening until investors get into the marketplace. Right now, the middle class investors, I mean, the high end folks, folks like yourselves, they're not worried, right? They, they, uh, um, bottom line, what's happening in the economy is not changing their lifestyle. It's not stopping them from buying gold. Uh, I've seen steady buying from those clients all along. Um, the middle class investors are actually starting to tap into their gold as an emergency supply, or a cash flow of liquidity. A um, few years back, you could tap into your home equity line, right? Use your house as a piggy bank um, and go ahead and use it to invest or buy stuff or what have you. Now people aren't doing that. That avenue is shut down because if they refinance now at 3%, they're moving to 8 Nobody's going to do that. Okay, so the next step is to go and put everything on your credit card. There's a reason that consumer credit is up over a trillion dollars right now on credit cards with double digit interest rates on those credit cards. It's because people are now using their credit cards to buy necessities, all right? And those necessities, they're buying the same necessities they bought last year, but they cost more this year because of last year and this year's inflation, so it looks like Consumer spending is resilient, right? I think that's what Jerome Powell said yesterday. It's resilient. We misunderstood all the savings that these people had. I don't think he misunderstood the savings. I think they're putting it on their credit cards. And that will end, by the way, not well. So now we're starting to see people tapping into gold. We have small liquidations coming from our long-term clients as they try to meet make ends meet. Um, and it's not just me. I've talked with Dana and other dealers. We're not the only ones seeing this, so I don't think it's just a one-off happening. I think this is a trend that's developing. I think the middle class's back is being broken. I know the balance sheets um, where you know these banks had bought all these treasuries at, at lower price or, uh, high, or lower yield, higher prices, and then all of a sudden, it ramped up, um, and now they're taking, they're not taking it, they're, they're calling it unrealized losses, but their balance sheets are kaput, okay? Um, that will come to roost when we start seeing more delinquencies, when we start seeing commercial real estate, when they have to refinance those positions and you see commercial realtors just walking away from uh, their, their contracts. Um, 
I don't think this ends well. I think the bank is going to see a lot more pressure going forward. I'm not here to, to have everybody commit Harry Carey. There, there's a bright side. Gold has a function in all of this. But the bottom line is I think the scenario right now is not as rosy as they would have you believe. And I know, I talked on Kitco last night, should come out sometime this morning as an interview, but um, you know, the, the employment numbers uh, are, are resilient and strong. Well, that's the last indicator to go uh, when things go recessionary. Okay, because when everything finally hits the wall and it's all said and done, then employers start saying, you know, I, I can't pay you anymore. So eventually people will start to get laid off. I think that'll be the last number that comes down, but I think it's coming down. Silver, similar reaction, just more pronounced, right? It, it's more volatile than gold because it's a smaller capitalized market. So if you buy into my narrative that gold is essential, the question is, well, how do I deal with it in my portfolio? And Again, this is what I do. Um, it's not for everybody, but hopefully here there will be some thoughts that you can use in your own allocation of your portfolio. First thing is gold is essential for two reasons in my opinion. One is as insurance. That's number one always, all the time. Uh, and profit, sometimes. Okay? And like Dan um, sorry, Omar said on the panel yesterday, he just wrote an article, those of you get that our, our information line newsletter came out for November this morning. If not, ask us for it, send us a quick email, we'll pop it to you. Um, there's an article from Omar in there where he talks about this 11 year cycle in precious metals and how 2022 was the bottom. And we're looking now 11 years to, to, to the highs. Uh, his point is, if you're looking to buy gold and potentially silver, now is the time. I can't argue with them. I think there's a lot of things that are going to come out that, that'll make that a worthwhile investment. But two different things, insurance and profit. Gold as wealth insurance, for me, by definition, is the store of purchasing power with high liquidity for a potential financial crisis that you hope you never have, right? Um, so the way I deal with that is you, you set up an allocation. For me, that's 10% in gold. Gold is my wealth insurance. It's a monetary metal. It's not industrial. It is strictly monetary. Maybe sprinkle in a little silver for divisibility, uh, but you can also do the same with fractional gold. Um, but really, gold is my wealth insurance. That's, that's my hedge. That's my chaos hedge, if you will. Um, I allocate 10% of net worth to gold, okay? And I never, ever sell it unless I need to. If I have an emergency, I don't hesitate. That's what it's there for. Okay, um, I sell it immediately, I meet the financial crisis, and then as soon as I am able, I start to build up my allocation again to where I'm full. Okay, and that's its purpose. I usually start by taking delivery myself. It is probably not the safest way to do, go about business, it's probably not the most cost effective way to go about business, but it's always my starting point, because by definition, it's gonna be highly liquid. I have a great product at Perth Mint that's free storage, low premiums, but it's halfway around the world. If I need it today, I wanna to put my hands on it and I wanna meet my, my needs. So I take delivery first, um, up to the point where I can meet any short-term needs to bridge a gap until I can access funds elsewhere or until I feel no longer comfortable safeguarding it and storing it myself. Because the cheapest way to hold metal is directly yourself until it's lost or stolen. And it's by far the most expensive, okay? So that's the way I deal with wealth insurance. Hold on to it, never sell it unless I need to. And if I never need to, wonderful, pass it on to my kids, give them a start in life, okay? For profit, completely different bucket of metals for me. And this, I actually like gold and silver, but I weight this to silver. Why? Everybody, does everybody understand how gold and silver work together in the precious metals complex? Who, who's your leader? Gold, absolutely. The rest of the metals follow, right? So gold will start moving down in a bear market, the other metals will follow. Gold will start moving up in a bull market, the other metals will follow. Silver is no different. The difference with silver though is it's more pronounced. So when it follows down in a bear market, it tends to outpace and goes deeper. 
percentage-wise than gold does. Uh, when it turns and gold goes up, silver will follow, and it tends to outpace to the upside. We talked about this a little bit on the panel and how silver has been lagging. And I know Dana said he loves it here. I can't argue with him because it has not really started to get going yet. It's kind of kept pace sort of in a way, but it looks like it's building up a lot of momentum to eventually explode. So I like silver because from the lower lows to the higher highs, you have a better profit potential. Last bull market, 2001 to 2011, uh, gold appreciated in 10 year time 650%. How much did silver go up? Over 1,000%. Okay, that's the potential in silver. That's why I like it for profit. Um, why is it that explosive? It's a more volatile marketplace because it's a less capitalized market. So I, I give the example of uh, the effect of throwing a stone into a puddle versus a lake. Gold's market is the lake. Silver's market is the puddle. has a much bigger impact. Okay, so that's kind of why I like silver more for profit, but I keep them both. I tend to allocate another 10 to 15%, not of net worth, but of investable assets in for-profit metals when the time is right, like when Omar says you were starting an 11-year up, upward cycle. Um, so at these times, I allocate another 10 to 15%, not of net worth, but of investable assets, so it's a smaller piece of the pie. Um, and I assess this periodically. Whenever you look at your portfolio, whether it be quarterly, semi-annually, annually, you look at it and you say, okay, I put 10% into silver for profit, and now it's 20% of my investable assets. What should you do? Sell half immediately. Okay, don't even think twice about it. Sell half. What if it dips down and now it's 5%? What do you do? Buy 5% buy more, right? If you do that all along in a bull market, who cares where the top is? You don't have to pick it. You just have to continue to buy well on the dips and sell when you have a profit and take profit all the way, okay? Um, and then you don't have to worry about it. Unless you can't tell the difference between where we're seeing a dip in a bull market versus the turn into a bear market, okay? If you see a turn into a bear market, now you want to sell and you're really not looking to replace it again. You probably want to start averaging out of your position, right? So how do you identify when this is a bear market turn, not a bull market dip? I have some ideas. Where, where, is the, where are the exits? First one is duration. We've only got two bull markets to look at because uh, gold was in a bull, prior to 70, uh, God, 71, right? When we took, closed the gold window, Nixon closed the gold window. Prior to that, we had an official price for gold. So anything before that really makes no sense. When it freely traded in the marketplace, now you can look at it and you say, okay, what are the relations? We've had two bull markets since then, 70, uh, to 80, 71 to 80 and 2001 to 2011. Both of them were about 10 years long. Okay, I think this one is a little bit longer because I think we've tweaked the marketplace like we've never done historically uh, and tweaked the money supply and played with the economies and whatnot. So I think this one's going to be a little bit longer. Um, but at about the 10-year mark, and most people feel that this bull market started in 2015 when we saw that breakout above uh, $1,500 an ounce, um, that that was the start. Uh, correction, $1,300 an ounce. That, that was the start. So if that's the case, somewhere around 2025 or later, you want to start looking for the exits, okay? Gold price. Um, again, we've only had a couple bull markets to choose from, um, but I'm looking for a two to three times the previous bull market high. What was the last bull market high? Anybody know? September of 2020 or 2011? 1921 an ounce. Okay, um, so I'm looking for somewhere between $3,500 and $4,000, basically. Um, that's where I think we should end up with in this bull market if things hold up. Nothing's guaranteed. Uh, so start looking for the exits, $3,500. GSR, gold-silver ratio. A lot of people say this doesn't mean anything anymore. It's another indicator. Why not look at it? Um, it's the ratio, uh, it's the number of ounces of silver it takes to buy one ounce of gold, okay? So historically, that bounces around somewhere between 35 on the low side to about 80 on the high side. 
In this marketplace with COVID and shutdowns and manipulations and the money supply, we've seen the gold-silver ratio get to an unheard of level of 127 a couple years ago, okay? It's been staying about 80 to 85 for a couple years since. Um, 80 is the magic number. It indicates that both gold and silver prices are lower and then 35 to 50 is the indicator that gold and silver prices are higher. Why? Remember, the relationship between gold and silver. Gold goes up first, silver follows and outpaces. So at both metals are moving up in value, silver goes faster, the ratio comes down. Okay? So gold-silver ratio right now is about 80. It suggests it's a great time to pick some up. When it gets back down near 35 to 50 an ounce, I'd be looking for the exits. Sentiment. How many people feel like gold is embraced and loved and everybody's clamoring to buy it right now? Exactly. You want to buy cheap, hated assets. Gold is there right now, in my opinion. Okay, it, we've seen a little surge by central banks. We've seen a little surge um, through crisis speculation and safe haven flows. But again, the investors are not in this market, I can tell you from experience. So when your Uber driver starts telling you how much money he made in silver, you might want to start looking for the exits. Okay, interest rates. We've got to get high enough in interest rates to overcome inflation, and I don't think the Fed can do it. I think they're already at the end of the rope. They cannot service the $33.5 trillion debt at this point. He can maybe go once or twice higher. I really think what he's going to try and do is talk inflation down with tough talk. Um, and I don't think that's enough. Eventually, we will see a pause and we will see a pivot. And when the, from the first interest rate decrease, we start seeing a better picture for gold, okay? Um, so I would expect, keep an eye on the Fed. Um, once uh, interest rates start coming down, I think all bets are off for anything but gold at that point. Um, start looking for the exits when it gets down to a much lower level. Uh, US dollar, strong right now, 106, but it was 116 last year, so it's not super strong. It's been below one or below 100 within the year, okay? It's the best looking horse in the glue factory. It's the, the least dirty shirt in the hamper, okay? You compare it to other currencies. By the way, in every other currency, gold is at all time highs, just not in the dollar yet. Um, and dollar is still looked at as a safe haven, and rightly, it should be. It's probably managed better than a lot of the other currencies. Doesn't mean it's really managed well, okay? So the dollar is strong. If it gets weaker, um, you're going to see a better position for gold. As it starts strengthening with sustained levels up 110 and higher, I think you start looking for the exits. Lastly, social and political instability. Um, anybody think we are socially and politically stable right now in this world, in this country, anywhere? Uh, I don't either, okay? We start to see peace break out, like Dana said, all over the world. Start to look for the exits. Now, I don't look at any one of these things and say, okay, it happened, it's time to get out. I want to see two, three, four of them start coming together. They're indicators, and when they come together, I say, okay, it's time. I think this is a bear market turn, not a bull market dip, okay? So if you know when to get out, then you can take profits all along the way. You can buy well all along the way and never worry about if you're going to miss the top. I put up this slide. Anybody know what this is? It's not measuring sticks, clearly. It's not the, the prices of measuring sticks going back a century or two. Um, this is... Yes? Absolutely. Very astute young man. Um, it's the Dow Jones priced in gold. Okay, if you look at this, you think, okay, nominally, the Dow Jones is at the highest levels we've ever seen. But priced in gold, we still haven't hit the peak of the dot com bull, bubble. Okay? Um, we are using the wrong measuring stick to measure value or wealth. That's my point of this slide, okay? Gold is a true measure of value, a store of purchasing power for millennia. The dollar is not. You saw it's lost like all of its purchasing power in 110 years, okay? So I liken it to like, let's say this table for, for argument's sake is six feet long, right? And I take a one, in, a one foot ruler and I measure it, it's gonna be six feet. What if tonight I cut an inch off the end of the ruler, now it's 11 inches, but I'm calling it a one foot ruler and I measure this table again. How, how, how long is my table? Math, see how, who's awake. Six and a half feet long. Did my table grow? Hell no. My measuring stick sucks. 
Okay, that's what it comes down to. Whatever you're measuring, time, length, value, you need the proper measuring stick, a stable measuring stick. If we measured everything in gold, I think price discovery would be a lot more meaningful than using dollars or yen or something else that has a fluctuating value, okay? When in doubt, zoom out. So all the people 10 years ago, five years ago, last year said gold's not doing its job. I beg to differ. This one tenth ounce gold coin that we're gonna give away this week, we've been doing this for like 20 some odd years now. Um, when I first started, gold was 250 an ounce. How much was this one tenth ounce gold coin? 25 bucks. Today, it's about $200, because gold's up around 2,000. Don't tell me gold's not doing its job. It is storing purchasing power. What we measure it with is not doing its job. If you ever have a doubt where gold is going and if it's being successful in its mission, look at the long-term chart. There's no question. It was flat for a long time when we had an official price, okay? And that little blip early on to the left in that chart, you see that little price spike? Anybody know what that is? Just for giggles? No. That was confiscation in 1933. So all the dealers that are out there trying to sell you gold for fear of confiscation, walk away from them, okay? Run away from them. They're trying to fear you, get your emotion to buy high-priced numismatics, right? And I sell numismatics too, and they have a purpose, but I'm not gonna fear you into it because you're worried about they're gonna confiscate gold again. I don't think they'll ever confiscate gold again in the US because 1933 was never about your gold. It was about the dollar. They collected as much gold as humanly possible. They raised the official price of gold and, in effect, devalued the dollar. That's what it was all about, okay? And eventually, you know, Jim Blanchard lobbied for all of our benefits, and, and they made gold legal to own again, and the price floated freely, and it did what it should have done for, forever once it was no longer tied to the dollar. But today, Gold is not tied to the dollar in any way, shape, or form. It's a tiny market. It's almost insignificant. There's no reason on earth for them to confiscate gold right now. Anybody who tries to sell on fear, run away, okay? Um, that's, they're just trying to get you to pay more for something that you probably don't need. Talking about measuring sticks and, and what, you know, you listen to the mainstream media, and like I said, the, the equities are up at all-time highs, right? This is what gold has done in the past 23 years, so far this millennium, versus the equities indexes, okay? Uh, Dow is up 191%. It's not too shabby in 23 years. Uh, same thing with the S&P, 188.2, 211.1 with the NASDAQ over that same time period. Silver is up 327.5%. Gold is up 587.5% in 23 years. Now, yes, we have had a bull market, but in that time, we also saw gold in that bull market from 1920 drop to 1,050 an ounce and start working its way back up to where we are today at uh, just under 2,000. So I didn't cherry pick this. This has got some bad data in it for, for gold as well. Um, but my point here is not that gold is where you make money in your portfolio. I don't believe that. I think there are other ways to make money. Gold is where you preserve your purchasing power. It's where you take some dollars today and you cryogenically freeze them for the future, uh, for future use, okay, at, at today's purchasing power level, okay? Mentioned a little bit about our company, a 42-year-old company. Uh, we've been doing this a long time. My uncle and his partner started it. Uh, we developed the Perthman Certificate Program. If you all have not looked at that for personal or IRA funds, I highly recommend you do so. Um, I don't know of a safer, cheaper way to own precious metals, gold, silver, and platinum, period, okay? Ask about it. It's available for personal or IRA funds. Uh, it's available in certificate or online form, uh, and uh, it's probably the best kept secret out there. We designed it for them 27 years ago. Um, one thing about us, uh, well, first I'll get the actions to take. See us at the booth, see me after this presentation, call us up, email it, email us, whatever you want to do, reach out to us. Our job is to listen to your needs and objectives and help you develop a plan for owning precious metals. We'll help you buy the dips. We'll help you sell well, uh, as best we can. Um, we offer a free newsletter monthly. Uh, went out today, uh, information line, I think, or yesterday. Information line went out, uh, or no, today, Thursday, first Thursday of the month. Um, it's a great art, uh, uh, 
newsletter. It's got four articles. One of them's from Amar, like I said, uh, and I give kind of the macro of what we think is going on in the marketplace, right, wrong, or indifferent. We also come out twice a week, th Tuesday and Thursday, with uh, always something interesting, a one-article read. Uh, these are all free. Consultation for coming and listening and putting up with me for 40 minutes is free. Uh, we give a one ounce silver eagle for every qualified purchase. That could be a one ounce gold, one ounce platinum, one ounce palladium, 100 ounces of silver. We'll give you a free silver eagle every time you buy. Um, and we've got a raffle. People in this room are entered twice if you come to the booth and get scanned there as well. And then I want you to call or email us for a special report. We take this very seriously. As gold price rises, we are going to see sharks enter the water and you guys are the prey, okay? Uh, people are gonna get into the bullion market um, looking for greed, not for customer service and a long-term business relationship, okay? And you might not know the deal. They're really nice people. They'll joke with them, you wanna go have a beer, um, but they're gonna, they're gonna take advantage of you unless you're armed with some tools, one of which, um, I'll just share it with you, and then you can get the rest by asking us for a special report. Just email us. Um, we may even just send it to everybody we scan. Uh, I'll take a look when we go back. Uh, but the bottom line is, uh, it's the 10 most common mistakes made by first-time gold buyers. And I don't care if you've bought gold for 20 years, I think it's worthwhile taking a look at it. It talks about ETFs versus gold. It talks about mining stocks versus gold. Love them both, but they, form, they fill different buckets in your portfolio. The one I'll, I'll leave at the top of the list to protect yourself. If you buy from me, I want you to feel comfortable. I encourage you to shop other dealers. What you'll find is we're always competitive, okay? Um, we may be the best price. We may not, but we'll always be in the ballpark. Nobody will ever touch us with customer service, okay? And the reason for that is Brian and his team um, are not paid a commission. It's unheard of in our industry. Um, I don't want to hang a carrot in front of their faces saying sell them something with more premium so you can make more money and send your kid to Stanford, okay? What I, what I want them to do is I want them to listen to your needs and objectives, right, and then help you achieve those goals and objectives as quickly and as cost effectively as possible. And if they take care of you well, I'll take care of Brian because I'd be a fool to let him go, okay? So that's the way we do business. Um, so the, the tip here is this. When you're ready to buy, shop around, but always ask the dealer, when I'm ready to sell this back, you haven't bought it yet, but when I'm ready to sell it back, will you buy it back? Not even how much. Will you buy it back? You would be surprised how many dealers say no. They don't buy back. They'll only sell it to you. Why? It's some of the best business on earth. I can buy from one client. I can pay them more than I could get if I had to sell it to a wholesaler and you know, sell it to somebody else. Um, I can pay them more, I can sell it to somebody cheaper than I can get it elsewhere, and I can make more money in the middle. Why on earth wouldn't I do that business? Here's why. If they don't buy back, it's only one reason. No matter what they said, they'll say, oh, you can sell it at auction and get more money and all this crazy garbage. It's garbage. They're not gonna buy it back because they don't wanna disclose what they sold it for which is versus what the market will bear when they buy it back. They charged you way too much. They have fancy TV, radio show, they pay a spokesmodel or whatever to, to sell their stuff. They have a four-color catalog. Who pays for all that stuff? You do, by the premium that they overcharged you. If they don't buy back, don't walk away, run. Okay, that's one bit of advice in the special report. I encourage everybody to ask for it. Um, we're approachable at all times. Michael, still very much involved in the company. His partner, Glenn, passed in 2010. Many of you have met him over the years. Incredible guy. Does my heart good to hear our sales force saying the things that he used to say when I joined the firm 27 years ago, even though they never met him. Um, but uh, you've got Michael, you've got myself, um, Brian, and his team. And in the end, our goal is to help you keep what's yours, whether that be uh, uh, keeping you free from the sharks or our original thought was preserving your purchasing power long-term with gold. If you can take a little bit of your portfolio, put it into gold, you can preserve that wealth and that purchasing power for when you need it in the future, okay? Um, at this point, I think we have a little bit of time. Uh, are there any questions? What booth are you? I don't, I don't know the booth number. Um, 313. 313 is, thank you, Brian. Rich? Yes, sir. Yeah. 
only uh, bullion, or do you do <coughs> stocks in gold and silver? That's a good question. So the question was, in, in the profit portion of the portfolio, do I include like mining stocks, or is it only bullion, or potentially maybe a slight uh, bit for numismatics even for profit? Um, for me, and this is in that special report, uh, I have mining stocks, I have resource stocks. I, I don't think it's a bad thing to say. Adrian Day manages it. We love him. Uh, but, um, and he does a great job, and we're glad to have it. But that's an equities allocation, okay? So the difference between bullion, physical, tangible bullion, and a mining stock is this is nobody's liability, nobody's promise or anything. It is intrinsically valuable. This is bullion, okay? Uh, a mining stock is wonderful, and you can get leveraged outside returns versus the gold price. You could also get leveraged outsized losses. What you got to understand is there are many more variables involved when you're buying a resource stock, right? If you take a gold company, their job in life is to mine gold profitably and return those profits to shareholders, right? Um, but you have to worry about management, you have to worry about rights, you have to worry about uh, the, the reserves, you have to worry about indigenous personnel, the market conditions and everything else, all these things factor in. So uh, you can have gold go up and a stock that sells gold or, or mines gold go down. Um, it's different, it's not the same as owning gold. I put it, I have it, I put it in an equities allocation, not in my bullion allocation. Great question. Yes, sir. Okay, um, I can't give any advice, but my, my opinion, after 27 years, is uh, that uh, I really don't care. I think I said this on the panel yesterday. Um, I don't care if it's sovereign. I don't, so the difference between a, a, a sovereign minted coin and a refinery or private minted uh, round, is what they're called, is really who makes it and how much trust you have in them. Okay, uh, there are some wonderful, wonderful refiners out there that make wonderful rounds and or bars. And I have no problem buying them. Uh, you know, Pamp uh, makes wonderful bars. Uh, you've got uh, Buffalo rounds from some of the uh, refiners here in the US. Uh, these are excellent products. And if, if their premium's cheaper than the Eagle, I don't have a problem whatsoever. The way you protect yourself with that type of merchandise is you buy from trusted dealers I'd hold my hand up as one of those, um, that buy from source distributors for the mints and the refiners. Uh, then you can guarantee that the product coming to you is legitimate, okay? But I love them and I, and I try to go to wherever the premium is the cheapest with something that I can trust. And we can help guide you through those waters. Great question. Anybody else? I couldn't have answered all of them, but I think we're out of time anyway. So I thank you all for coming. Um, I appreciate it. Come by the booth, uh, get scanned, but ask us any more questions you might have, and thank you for your time.